ena reo korohi, ena waha koroki, nau mai hoki mai anō kia tapatahi. Kia ora and welcome to Tapatahi. Thanks for joining us. It's Monday the 25th of May and this is Māori Television's morning news programme. Coming up, we talk to a unionist about Air New Zealand dumping three and a half thousand staff. Everyone was worried about tourism surviving COVID-19. Travel agents are in the same boat with no quick fix in sight. And we hear why public knowledge of our history is more important than a public holiday to observe the New Zealand wars. Heoi, a nei apotaka maipi me nga puto i kōrero o te wā. Tēnā koe wena e te iwi a ta māri e mō a ta rau. Tuatahi ake ki te tai toke rau, ki a tikara anō tōna whare ka tahi anō ka wātea mai ki te manā ki manuhiri. Koe nei te ia o te kōrero a Ngāti Kuri, mo te kapinga a te huarahi matua ki te rere ngā wairua, mō ngā tai pito pito kōrero, a nei te pūrongo a Dean Nathan. Ka hore nō ngā uri o Ngāti Kuri ke oki oki noa i ngā mahi tiaki i te rohe kāinga. Ko wātea o mātou kai mahi ki te here, ki te rere ngā wairua, ki tā puta puta, nā ki te aka tika tika, ki te horai i ngā wahi katoa, ki te aka pai pai, ki a kaua ai te tangata e pā ki te raru raru a te wā, ki a ka pūre ngā ai te keti i roroni. Nō reira, koe tēnā te kaupapa, I tēnei wā, hara te mea haka mana mana ana nga te kuri. E kaupapa tino pai tēnei mo tātou katoa. Ko te reo tērā o kere ama neho. Huri ake ki te tōranga pū ko te tikanga mo Todd Miller, te kai arataki hō o te rōpū nahinara, ko te whiriwhiri i tana kapa hō, hei whakaeke ki te kōwhiri ngā pōti a motu, tana mahi tuatahi. Ko Waikauru ki roto i te rārangi tuatahi o te kapa o te rōpū nahinara ka puta i te rangi nei. Engari kua pōkea aia ki te whakautu i ngā whakapai, he apataki no te prehitini o Amerika i a Donald Trump, e Todd Mueller. I'm not particularly close to his way of politics and I love the theatre of American politics. I will be the small business minister. Kei te tatari ngā hāhi o Aotearoa, mēnā ka tae rātau, te whakapiki ake i te nama o ngā kaipono, te whakakiki i ngā tūru. Kei raro i te tikanga o te ohiti tuarua e te kau noiho ngā tangata ka taea te haere ki ngā whare karakia. Koi e whakapono ana ngā minita o te hāhi mihingare, ka whakapiki ake taua nama i te toko iti o ngā nama o te mate korona. Hei te ahiahi nei, ka tuku pānui e te prīmia i te whakatau, te mutunga o te huirūnanga o te kāwanatanga. Tērā te whakapuakitanga a te minita whakawhanake ohanga Arohe a Shane Jones, e ono rau miriona tāra o te pūtea whakatipu i ngā rohe, ka hāngai atu ki te tuku ki ngā mahinga ka hohoro, ka whai hua oha oha, a nei a tāro i black me ngā whakamaramatanga. He ono rau miriona tāra, hei awhi i ngā pūnaha ohana Arohe mo ngā marama e rua ki te ono, kei te heke mai. Kia wawe te rerenga o te pūtea ki te pūkoro o ngā umanga, o ngā pākihi me te kaunihera. Shane Jones, ko te noho i te wānui a tāne e hara i te āhuatanga hou ki ngā hohua o ngā whānau o ngā i tūhoi. Ka mutu no te wā o te noho here, ko a kaha ke te rongo whānui nei i etahi te mate mate aone i te hono a te ki ore. I whai atu a mahina Herkmans i tētahi whānau i tā rātau whakatū puni ki runga whenua Māori hei nohonga mā ngā uri whakaheke. E honki ki tō u kai pō ki reira wānanga ai. E tū tonu nei, tū tonu nei nā rākau, e rere tonu ana te awa. E hara i te noho moho ao he ahuatanga hau mo ngā whānau maha o tūhoi. He oi no ngā tau maha tana o te wā kua kitea i te tino hira hira o te whakahoki i te whānau ki ngā whenua o rātau mātua tīpuna. We need te whenua o ngā mātua, o ngā kuia koroua, a kia nohi e ngā tamariki. Ko te reo tērā o tūruhira hare. 
huri aki ana ki te hākina kina, kei te hia hia te whakataitai e ngā rau te whakatūwhira e ngā papatākoro ki ngā kai. Mā taki taki ngā kai apataki ki ngā tukinga, hei ngā wiki e whā e tū mai nei. Hei te taite ka timata te whakataitai e ngā rika kapi ngā tatau ki ngā kai mā taki taki mō te marama tuatahi. A kā ti ake, mō tēnei pito tai pito pito ka hoki ki a tapatahi. Kia ora pōtaka. While Air New Zealand will lay off a third of its workforce, around 3,500 people, because its revenue has dropped from nearly 6 billion to 500 million. Even in a year's time, it'll be 30% smaller than it is today. The Union Air 2, the largest union for aviation workers in the country, represents around 4,000 Air New Zealand staff. Rachel McIntosh, a support director and assistant national secretary for Air 2, joins me now. Kia ora, Rachel. Kia ora, Morena. So what are Air New Zealand staff telling you about how they've been treated? The staff are feeling devastated. Uh, you know, when you work for Air New Zealand, the company calls its staff Air New Zealanders. So when people get laid off, that's they're not just losing income, they're losing a job, they, they're really losing. It's almost like a nationality. Air New Zealand received a $900 million bailout from the government and the wage subsidy has been extended. So why are there so many redundancies? Yeah, well, one of the things that um, we have been saying to the company is that at that this time, and there is a big crisis, um, it's even more important that they take the welfare of the people they employ into account and really listen to the voices that are coming, coming through. And nobody knows what the future is going to hold. Um, everything's just guesswork. There's no science at this point. Um, so, yeah, we, we really do um, call on the airline to listen to the voices of the workers and to treat them with dignity. And it's, not, it's more than just a commercial enterprise in New Zealand. You know, it's our national carrier and it's got a huge central part in our infrastructure, not just our physical infrastructure, but the social infrastructure of this country. Is it putting people or profit before people? It is. So instead of um, taking more account of the needs of the staff at this time, it is looking really to cut costs and to save money. That is um, what they've stated that they're doing. Which parts of the airline have been hardest hit? Cabin crew, pilots, support staff? Uh, it's, it's right across. Uh, but so for our membership, 70% of the international crew are going. There's 30% right across the company, but in, among union membership, among E2 membership, it's going to be um, closer to 40% of, um, of the staff that are going. So 900 uh, long haul air crew are going, 1,500 air crew, um, flight attendants together. But it's right through airports, ground staff, um, engineering, it's, it's right across. There isn't much of an airline service um, for us, the consumer, but what will uh, Air New Zealand services look like in the future? This is one of the things that we are asking, is that the unions, the union membership has um, gets to play a part in what that vision will be and what the airline will look like. You know, it's our national carrier. Um, the people who do the work should have a say in what that future will be. There's certainly scope for it. Um, you've heard the Prime Minister calling for four-day weeks so that we can do domestic tourism. We would like to be talking to the company about what that can mean for the work of, the, of our members at Air New Zealand. Why aren't those uh, head honchos from Air New Zealand talking to the union? They are talking, but they're talking very much about this is what we're going to do, these are our decisions, and we are calling on them to go back to the practices that they have had until very recently which is proper engagement and forums where the voices of the people doing the work really are heard and that the workers can have some influence on the direction of the company and on the decisions that are being made. We want union members involved in all decisions where the airline is concerned. Air New Zealand has built a strong Māori brand. Is that likely to be affected as well? Well, it... it it's too, so, too soon to tell. There is a, a network within the company of um, Māori. Um, they, have, they have a taha Māori, um, which they give their crew who um, speak te reo. Uh, so we we'll just have to see um, whether that's affected. But that's one of the things that we'll be wanting to talk to the airline about as well. 
I also noted that um, last week three of its senior uh, managers were also uh, let go. What does that mean in terms of, I suppose, the morale to other uh, workers in, in New Zealand who have also been made redundant? <laughs> It may help a little bit, but when you've had your livelihood and, you know, your identity kind of whipped away, it probably is small comfort that there are people at the top taking some pain as well. Now, Airways may close seven of its regional air traffic control towers because of a collapse in traveller numbers. Is there an update there? I don't have an update on that, sorry. But it does look like a mess for the airline industry. That's right, and this is where, where we want to have a voice and we want to sit down with the company and talk about the future and, and talk about the effect on the country, the effect on communities and the effect on particularly small, you know, non-urban centres that the airline is there to serve. They're our national carrier. And, uh, yeah, so what we want is to be having a talk about what that means for them, what their role is, more than just a commercial enterprise. Is there a role here for the government to intervene in any way? The government is a majority shareholder, mm -hmm. so their arrangements are that they're at arm's length. But we welcome the government's view on the future of aviation, on the future of the country. We definitely think there's a role for more voices in the conversation. Uh, so um, not just the company dictating, but um, the workers who work there having a say, the communities who are affected having a say, and, um, and yeah, the government is part of that picture. Rachel McIntosh, a, an Assistant National Secretary for Air 2 Union. Thank you very much for your time. Good luck. Hold on. Well, race relations conciliator Meng Foon has revived a call to observe the New Zealand wars as a public holiday, saying now is the right time to do so. But Kafia de Murahi, the president of the Battle of Orako Heritage Society, says public knowledge of our history is more important than a public holiday. Kafia is here now to discuss this. Morena. Morena, Morena, Tukohine. Now, let's go back to the start. How did the idea of a national commemoration of the New Zealand, uh, New Zealand Wars begin? Can you just briefly summarise how, how it all began? Sure. Around 2010, um, a small group were um, involved in planning uh, the commemoration of the Battle of Ordaco. That small group, as part of um, evolving the constitution of the organisation, had a discussion around the concept of raising the idea of a national day as part of their key intent. And the idea of promoting and encouraging a national day to commemorate, commemorate all the wars of Aotearoa was enshrined in the constitution and became part of our board's uh, work um, in those early years. We uh, advocated uh, the concept with uh, Te Riki Nui the range of other Māori leaders, and every year we held um, uh, commemorations on the old battle site. Mm -hmm. We spoke and advanced the idea of a national day mm -hmm. so that all of our people, and in fact all of those who, who died and who suffered, would be remembered at one place and one time. Uh, and we were fortunate enough um, a couple of years later with the support of Nanaya Mahuta and uh, Oops. Oops. meet up with some young ladies from Motorahama College and advance the notion of a petition, and it has gone uh, from there forward. So what are some of your big concerns about this issue, about making the news, observing the New Zealand uh, wars as a public holiday? Look, we absolutely support Ming's call. Uh, well, it's not Ming's call, it's a national call. Um, we absolutely support the idea of a public holiday. I think the key issue for us, looking at the COPE over the last 10 years, is that we, before we go down to enshrine um, this concept into uh, legislation, we really need a huge investment in socialising what the COPE is about across middle New Zealand. Now, our people uh, are very... I would say, uh, historically aware. Uh, our Tupuna were involved in these. We suffered as a result of these uh, wars, but not only wars. Uh, there were also major uh, passive resistance campaign 
which were um, driven through Parihaka, Taranaki. So I think for most of our people, uh, this concept is, is very easy to uh, to support and to understand. The challenge is middle New Zealand. <clears throat> and so there needs to be a lot of work done in middle New Zealand uh, to bring that level of knowledge, that level of respect for the kaupapa, uh, in advance of moving to actually put it into legislation as a public holiday. Our concern is that if we move too quickly, um, this day will be merely a day to take the barn out to the beach, to mow the lawns, have a barbecue and a few beers with the mates. And uh, we do not want that. This is a very important kaupapa, and it deserves um, good, solid planning, good coordination, national national PR campaign, and excellent execution to get it right. While well, iwi hold their own local events to commemorate important battles and, and those who fell, is that enough to educate our own people about their history? I think it's a good start. It's definitely a start um, to uh, but it certainly, I think there's a lot more that can be done in that space. And um, I think it's great that we have uh, commemorations now across the Motu. Uh, we have regions and uh, various battle sites uh, doing what they feel appropriate to do in the space. But certainly more resources, more support, um, more socialising of the Copa Bay as well. So is there more can, uh, discussion to be had with the government, with Nanaia Mahuta, for instance, around this whole issue about pushing the kaupapa of New Zealand wars and the history of New Zealand uh, for the middle public, as you put it? I, I think it's, there is a lot more court that needs to take place. Um, and it's not just only with Nanaia, it's with her colleagues as well in the uh, cultural and heritage space in the defence space, um, across across the board, really, because we are talking about a national cover and one which is important in that we need to understand where our economy has come from. You now, the origins of our national economy rest way back in those days <clears throat> where our people's lands were uh, taken, our people were uh, removed from their homelands, economies decimated. Uh, as an example, around Te Aumutu, uh, Bangi Alfia, prime example, and other places as well. So we need to really understand the origin of where we've come from, and we can't do that unless we go back to the beginning of our problems. Um, and they are part of that story, if I may say, a part of that journey. It's not the complete journey. A part of that journey goes back to uh, the time where colonisation had a very firm focus on removing our people off our hands and undermining to uh, Mano, to Māori, Mutuhake. But that's a part of the journey back. Ka whia murahi, tēnā koe i ōu whakaaro i wēnā whakamārama. Anui tumi hatu kia koe te tua hine rana. Kia ora. A kāti hea ha ōu whakaaro mō ā mātou kaupapa. Pōhi mai ki runei te pārani pukamata o whakaata Māori i mērā mai rānei kia tapatahi at maoritelevision.com. He whakatā poto te hārea ke nei, kia mau tonu mai. Kia ora anō. Homeowners, builders and DIYers will soon have an easier time making basic home improvements. The government has scrapped the consents process uh, for low-risk building work such as sleepouts, sheds and carports. This will allow the construction sector to kickstart work on larger projects, providing more employment opportunities for the country's post-COVID recovery. Builder Himio Nahunia says this will make building projects such as Papakaina a lot easier too. He's here to talk about this now. Kia ora, Himio Na. Uh, kia ora, Morena. So these, these new exemptions to the Building Act will save homeowners $18 million in consenting costs each year, but doesn't that take money out of your pocket, out of builders' pockets? Um, yeah. Uh, to a certain degree, um, but what it kind of uh, helps is uh, uh, the process for, I guess, the, the customer or the client who uh, are building their own homes. So it'll, it'll save them 
um, more prutea um, more than me, which is kind of the, the whole point, is for whānau to be able to afford um, their own, um, I guess, small whare to uh, address some of the overflows for, for our people that are struggling to find kāinga out there. So, yeah, that'll definitely help. What about safety and quality? Is that still at risk? And, and I'm, I'm remembering my DIY father who would put taps on the wrong way, for instance. Isn't quality and safety still at risk? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, we've got to be careful with, uh, with those restrictions and things like that for water supply and any type of heating and cooking facilities for fire risk. Uh, we do have to look at those uh, issues throughout the building and make sure that we're um, adhering to all the safety risks. Um, and yeah, there's, there's ways of getting through those um, if we follow all the um, guidelines through the uh, documents of uh, building performance, safety, and things like that. So there's yeah, there's definitely information there for us to follow. And um, yeah, as long as we keep to those guidelines, um, we should be able to get through um, the process uh, quite easy. The government says uh, this will help uh, build more houses, but you're also looking at Papakaina as well, Popano, Hapu and Iwi. So how does it do that? How does this project do that? Uh, at the moment, we're still in the early stages of understanding what um, that process is and, and, and how this is, that's going to all um, impact um, impact that, um, that area of, of Papakainga. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions and boundaries and distances of where you are and where you can um, build these um, small 30 square metre homes. Um, and yeah, I guess in time we'll, we'll get a better understanding of, of how that works and, and what that means uh, for our whanau and, and people with their own blocks of land and and things like that. So, yeah, uh, in time, it shouldn't be too far away. I haven't got the full scope of, of what that actually means, but it's a good idea. You know, I think uh, opening it up to to um, 30 squares as opposed to 10 squares, you can just imagine how small that is, um, but it sort of allows for, yeah, a bit more space, I guess, and, and yeah, different things to utilise that that size building, so, yeah. I just, want, I just wanted to go back a bit um, to the quality of construction. Doesn't this open the way for more leaky houses, more leaky buildings? Does it open the way? Sorry, can you ask that again? Does this open the way for, for the quality issues? Does this open the way for more leaky buildings, for more shoddy workmanship, though? Um, yeah, well... I think, as they stated on uh, the news there where, where it was put out, um, that you still must follow the guidelines and, and the building performances of uh, 3604 New Zealand Building Code and, and making sure that you are uh, building things to spec and, and um, that they're not um, going to be substandard um, buildings. Um, yes, we're probably going to get people who think they know how to how to build, but that's, you know, at their own risk. I think, yeah, we need to be vigilant and we need to be proactive in making sure that we follow uh, the building performance guidelines so that we're, our whanau is safe and we know that we're doing the, uh, the right job and making sure um, yeah, everything is above board in accordance to the building code. You've mentioned that there's still little detail about this whole project or the, this actual plan of the government. So what are you waiting for exactly? OK, so all so all the uh, under Schedule 1, Section 42A in the Building Act 2004, um, that is the original exemption um, schedule for non-consent uh, buildings. So under that, um, it tells you all the performances and all the, um, I guess, the legal uh, requirements uh, that you may undertake. Um, and uh, thus far, it hasn't been put anything, or I haven't found um, 
information or obtain any information on what um, comes with that. So under the 10 square metre, um, it was that you were not allowed to use cooking facilities, sanitary, or you had to make sure um, that your stormwater and um, sanitary facilities were, weren't were in that building. So to me, that's saying that it's an open building with nothing in it. So we just got to, I'll track uh, to see how, how this goes. And um, yeah, I'm sure there'll be more information that, that will follow uh, in the next few few days. Kia ora ehua. Thank you very much for your time this morning and for your explanations. Kia ora. O tauna puoro artist Reti Headley is preparing for Māori Music Month in August. Reti's compositions feature a mix of tauna puoro and contemporary instruments, and travelling in Asia for a year has also influenced his style. Reti joins us as does uh, one of his collaborators, Moiti Smith, Te Nā Kōrua. Reti, can I start with you first of all? Your late mother, Rangi Iria, uh, was also a Taonga Puoro artist. Can you tell me about her um, and how this became a family tradition? Uh, yes, well, it all started uh, way back when uh, I came into this world and my mother was joining forces with uh, the likes of uh, Rangi Skipper, Bernard Makaware, uh, and the and the late uh, Hedini Melbourne. Uh, they spent a lot of their time in the Waikato uh, learning and uh, performing, also creating uh, in, in Te Ao or Te Taonga Puro. And my, my part now is to continue that journey. Um, I whaka papa through my mother to Tu Whareto. And uh, we also have a deep history of Taonga Puro that relates to our whānau through uh, Ngāti Turu Makina. And uh, I think right now, all I can say is that uh, me and Moitu are on the path of growing and developing in these arts, and we're really, really passionate about it. Moitu, if I can come to you now. Both of no. you are testing this fusion of Tauna Puoro and contemporary music. How would you describe it? Um, I, I think it's actually quite a, an amazing um, journey that we're on because it's it's new ground. It's um, it's bringing our Māori culture into a more positive light and in a mainstream light. So it's it's been quite experimental, like you say, but um, uh, the weight of it is just something special. Um, it, it's really it's really touching my spirit quite a lot, and I'm. Um, I'm learning a lot through it too. So what instruments do you play more to? I play the bass guitar. Um, so I'm playing it in a different way through um, through this project with uh, Riti. Um, having Tonga Puhoro as the main instrument. Um, it's not so often you get the modern day chords in a, in a Tonga. So I'm having to play chords rather than just the normal way of playing the bass, so it's it's quite cool. It's um, experimental, at, at the least. <laughs> Leti, you spent a year travelling in Asia and came up with the Native Travellers Channel. How did that inspire your use of Tāuna Puro, your music? Wow, it, it was it was a huge inspiration. Uh, travelling through those whenua, you get to experience a lot of iwi take take that are just simply living. Um, they're also fighting their own battles, tribal battles, uh, iwi battles against the powers that be. And I can see that they're still trying to maintain uh, their heritage through their music. They're trying to maintain their heritage through their dance, through their reo. Uh, but if you take a closer look into those whenua mainstream uh, music is still overpowering the native sound. And what I found really, really, um, and this was an accident, but really inspirational, was going through their whenua, filming everything that I see, extracting the audio 
of any instrument I could find. It didn't matter whether it was a troll from Northeast India, whether it was gamelan from uh, Myanmar or Thailand. I, it didn't matter to me. There were no rules when it comes to uh, the, the sounds of native instruments. No laws, no scales, no rhythms that, that really um, have influenced me here in Aotearoa. And so I extracted that and I used that to cr as a basis of a lot of the compositions that I created for me and my darling when we created the YouTube channel Native Travelers. Who's your and darling? And it's something that I continue to do today and I, and I really, really would love to see how I can utilize the voices of those lands and merge them with the voices of our lands, of Aotearoa. Tell me, awesome. can I? Can you tell me who's your darling? Oh, my darling. Ah, he he uri no te aitanga o Dati Honui o Ngaitahu. Her name is Bianca Angel. Kia ora. Yeah. Okay. Moitu, can I come back to you? Um, uh, Reti just talked about uh, how uh, native sounds can be overpowered. So how do you guard against that? Maybe you can um, talk about it first and then we'll go back to Reti. Uh, I, I personally think that we can uh, guard that by doing what we're doing. And and as uh, Riti and I started uh, this journey, we, we we had a story to it, a pain to it, and that's just to bring our culture um, out of sort of not being really um, taken notice of. We're, we're following the footsteps of a few others, but uh, with this, we wanted to bring our culture into the light and... Um, and more of a more positive way and in, in, into the mainstream. And I think that's all that we as Māori can do when it comes to our culture, because if we don't promote our own culture, then it's going to die. And um, through through this, I hope that we can uh, continue to encourage others um, to step out and be bold and, and, and stand up for their culture and what they believe in, in um, I think that's the best way that we can guard it, is, is to teach others. I'm sorry, uh, we don't have any more time left, but Leti, thank you very much for joining us. You too, Moito. Later, uh, Moito, later in the show we'll have some of the experimental music that you have both been working on. We're an awful, uh, we'd like to know what you think. Please let us know on our Facebook page or send us an email, tapatahi at maoritelevision.com. Kia huria ki tātou i nāinei, ki nātai pito pito o te wā. Tēnā koe wena rarau mai anō rā e te iwi. Karekau he mate tūroro korau na hō i Aotearoa i roto i ngā rua te kau mā whā haora kua paure a kenei. Nā ko nā ko te tatau o ngā tūroro katoa tūturu mai tūpono atu e noho tonu ana ki te kotahi mano e lima rau mā whā. E ono rau miri ona tāra ka whakatōkia e te minita whakawhanake o hanga arohe ki ngā mātou. Mahi wawe te whai hua oha oha. Ko ngā rangatira whare, kai whakatū whare, ringa whakapai o rātou ake whare anō hoki ka whiwhi āwhina i te tū a te kāwanatanga ki te whakakore i ngā here mo te whakatū whare mō rea rea kore nei. Pērā i te whare moi iti, i te whare waka i te wharau rā nei. Mā tēnei e āhei ana te ranga whakatū whare, te hoki wawe ki te mahi i ngā mahi nunui i whakatū, tūranga mahi ai. E āwhina hoki i te oranga mai anō o te ohanga i ngā whiu o te wā o te mate korona. Kei te hiahia te whakataita NRL, te whakatūwhira i ngā papatākoro ki ngā kai mā takitaki, ngā kai apataki ki ngā tuki ngā hei ngā wiki e whae tū mai nei. Hei te taite ka timata anō te whakataita riki NRL, engari ka kapi ngā tatau ki ngā kai mā takitaki mo te marama tuatahi. A kāti. Koe nga tāku mo tēnei haura, ka hoki anō kia koe wena. Kia ora, Pōtaka. Well, more than 350,000 people have signed up to the government's new COVID-19 contact tracing app. The app is a digital diary recording the time and date people visit places. Users also register their contact details, which are held by the Ministry of Health and only used if needed for contact tracing. Technology expert Karaitiana Tayuru developed the Māori guidelines for data and artificial intelligence, the first indigenous initiative for new technologies in the world. Karaitiana is with us now to share his views about the contact tracing app. Morena Ehoa. Morena. 
Well, first of all, can you just summarise how this app works? Sure. So the New Zealand government app um, basically stores... Uh, you take a, um, a picture of a QR code and that stores the location and time on um, a server um, on, your, on, your, on your cell phone. And there's also details that are stored on a server in Australia. Um, at any time that the Ministry of Health need your information, um, if there's been a, um, a, a case of COVID at a, a venue that you are at, then it's, um, you can get an alert on your phone um, saying you need to go to the Ministry of Health or you know, there was a case at a venue that you are at on you know, a certain time of day. It took almost six weeks to launch the app. Is it still useful given we seem to be over the worst of this pandemic? We could have used it many weeks ago. Sure. Yeah, designing apps is it's not always a simple um, process. Sometimes it yeah, can be quite complicated. And when you work within government, you have to. there's a lot of um, steps and um, policies and procedures you need to follow. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think it's useful to still have um, based on the media, I mean, there's second outbreaks of COVID occurring around the world. So if it does occur again in New Zealand, then we've got the app to, yeah, to assist us. Not everyone has a smartphone. Some whānau have one phone between nine people. Some people are on prepaid or plans that don't include the internet. What happens to them in this instance regarding the app? So those people won't be able to um, use the app. Um, if they don't have a smartphone and don't have um, data, essentially. Um, people, uh, whānau that have multiple users per uh, one device, um, I, I'm assuming they're just going to have to also kind of remember which whānau member was where when they used the app. So a bit of paper on the fridge door would also suffice? Uh, yes, definitely, yes. <laughs> And it's probably a lot more um, private too. <laughs> well, speaking of that, the Ministry of Health has been at pains to emphasise uh, privacy and controllers in the hands of the users. Can we trust that our data is safe? So, uh, to, a, to a point, yes. But um, for me personally, the issue is um, personal data is being stored in Australia oh. on an American-owned service. So that means our data um, is under the jurisdiction of three different countries, Australia, America and New Zealand. Um, if for any reason the American government needed or wanted that data, they have the full rights to access it and use it uh, as they wish. Holy moly. OK, well, please also trialled facial recognition software recently that used a database of images searching specifically for wanted people of Māori or Polynesian ethnicity to see whether that system would struggle to identify non-Europeans. So, again, in using this kind of... By the way, that, that police action was legal. But again, in using this kind of app, how do we protect our data? Um, so, the, the best way to... Um, protect our data with the, um, the COVID-19 app would be to use a, a different app. Um, there's another app on the market, um, which um, the um, Dr. Bloomberg um, said he used as well, um, called Ripple. It's um, made in New Zealand. Um, it's applied the um, Tetility ethics to as much of the app as they can. And that app leaves your information only on your phone. And so it's 100% private, unless, of course, someone takes your phone, but uh, then you lose all your other data. Well, you developed Māori guidelines for this sort of new technology. What protocols would you apply to any of these apps? Sure. Uh, I would have um, just that the data remains on a person's cell phone and is only um, accessible if the owner of the data um, sends it to the Ministry of Health or to whatever other organisation. Uh, I also um, suggest that um, the app would cater for our whānau who do have multiple users per phone. And I'd also suggest that the app should be in, uh, in te reo Māori as well as English, um, simply because there's, we, we do have whānau who understand um, the, the app and the language a lot easier if it was in te reo Māori. 
Great talking to you this morning. Thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. Well, let us know your thoughts on today's programme. Post your feedback on our Facebook page or send us an email, tapatahi at maoritelevision.com. Stay with us. We'll be back after the break. Well, during lockdown, travel agents were busy helping clients who were stranded overseas and dealing with some understandably worried people about cancellations, refunds and credits. But they also had an eye on their business and the impact of COVID-19. With closed borders, no overseas travel and no tourists, the future is looking bleak. Pamela Tukaki, a sole owner-operator of a travel agency in Topol, says the government's advice isn't much good either. She joins me now. Kia ora, Pam. Oh, kia ora. So what did you find when you went looking for help to stay afloat? Well, I've owned my travel agent business for eight years. Um, half of my working life has been in travel. So when I saw on TV that the government was giving money uh, for Māori businesses, I went to go and look for it. Um, there was no clear direction of uh, where I could find it. And five days later, I was just told that they, we won't be getting any capital, so there was nothing there for me. Why not yeah. take out a business loan? Um, it's probably, it's a debt I don't need. Um, and how am I going to pay it back when we're at zero income mm -hmm. in our industry? Now, the government has, has launched a domestic tourism campaign. Will that help you? Uh, Kiwis book travel online or direct. Um, that's how it's always been. Um, and they're also encouraged to book through eyesights and probably not um, in my industry because we mainly deal with international travel. So, not really, no. <laughs> How about the Trans-Tasman <laughs> bubble? Would that be a help? I'd like to think it would um, in our industry, but it's only a very small percentage um, of our business and the margins are very low. Um, I'd like to believe it might help, but to be honest, in the short term, no. So can I just go back to some of those advisors that you were talking to? What kind of solutions did they offer you? Were, were they helpful? No. <laughs> they told me to pivot. Um, that's apparently the new word now, to pivot your business. Um, but, you know, they just said that they'll put me through to an advisor to advise me of how to pivot. Um, it's just useless information, really. I've been in the business for eight years. So I don't need, they don't need to pay someone to tell me how to do my business. I know what I need, um, but yeah, not helpful at all in my industry. And, and there have been obviously some tourist uh, uh, money coming out of the government for uh, places like the New Zealand Māori Arts and Crafts Institute, for instance, who probably won't be making that much, that much money too. Is that what sort of financial help you're looking for? Uh, yeah, I'm looking for actually capital to keep my doors open um, because travel agents need to keep their doors open because we've got uh, these $2 billion of refunds and credits that we're waiting for. And if we close our doors, who's going to, you know, be able to give that back to our customers? So, yeah. What does the future look for you look like for you now? Um, right at this moment, um, for a whole year, probably pretty bleak um, within the travel industry. I'm not the only one. It's worldwide issue, but let's just talk about New Zealand. Um, no one knows when the borders are going to open, and uh, yeah, that's. That's basically all we need. So I think that the money that they've provided for Māori businesses is not directed. Um, they've put it into, you know, it's not directed properly. That's what I think anyway. They've, they've directed that money to a bunch of advisors that can't help you? Yes. And as I said, pivot. Uh, I know what to do with my business, but yeah, it's just a new word, pivot. The Travel Agencies Association of New Zealand, how are they helping you? 
Um, they're actually lobbying um, the government um, because they did put out a letter. And so how are they helping? That's all they can do. Um, it's up to the government, I suppose. I think they're going into talks with them today. So uh, that's all I know. Just lobbying to help the travel industry. Kia ora, Pamela So we can get some of that money. Yeah. Kia ora, Pamela, and, and good luck for the future. Thank you. Kia ora. Naitahu Komatua Michael Skerritt has been going to the Mutton Bird or Titi Islands off the southernmost coast of Lakiuta Stewart Island for more than 65 years. His whanau has the privilege of being among the few Naitahu families that have sole authority to gather or harvest the birds. But this year's harvest was cut short by COVID-19 restrictions and the hunters spent just a couple of weeks there. Michael Skerritt joins me now to discuss this on the phone. Tēnā koe. So how were the birds this year? Will the shortened season make a difference to availability and the price of a bucket of titi? Uh, yes, it does. I, don't, I think probably only about half the normal amount of people uh, went down, I think. So that makes a shortage. And then, of course, um, your expenses are the same. And uh, with more limited time down there, it, it just means to... Uh, uh, come out of it, the uh, prices have to go up, and it's the old supply and demand, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, did you make it over to the islands? Yes, I did, yeah. Yeah, very, very short war uh, warning, really, yeah, they just, when they finally let us go. I'd been doing uh, quite a bit of lobbying with uh, Renal Tirikata, and, he, and he, I think he worked with his colleagues, and he got back to me when we were able to go and he said uh, the advice, the information that I'd given was uh, helpful. So, um, yeah, so we, we, we got down there. A bit of a gamble because it was about 11 days later than it would normally go down. So, you know, you've got to cut tracks and fix your houses and all sorts of things. And uh, so it made it pretty limited. And then sometimes the birds are gone quite early and in the month of May, but they uh, were in good condition and uh, the weather was pretty fine, which can affect them. Uh, if it's rough, they tend to come out at night and go. And uh, the moon, they don't like the moon either, and we had full moon on the 7th of May, and that sort of held them up too. So it, it, we, we had a reasonable uh, season, you know. And, of course, the main thing for us is the birds being a good nick and those that get away will survive. It's really important for the future. In the 65 years, Michael, that you've been over to the islands and harvesting titi, El Nino, fur seals, climate change, these are all some of the problems that are, are affecting the titi islands. Do you Fano get enough support to conserve the nature of the islands? Uh, well, it's up to us to look after them. Um, it, 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 climate change is the big one, and the incidence of El Nino. When we get El Nino, the production of plankton drops, mm. and that's the bottom of the food chain, and the whole success of, of the breeding is around the food supply. When they migrate back from the northern hemisphere, they fly about nine days, a thousand k's a day without feeding. So they, like all migratory species, they lose about 30% of their body weight. And if they arrive uh, back in El Nino conditions, uh, they struggle to get in condition to breed. And it was a bit that way this year. It was, the climate was sort of neutral, leaning slightly towards El Nino. So they were, the birds were younger than they should really be. But that also contributed to, probably to them, their internal clock making them want to come out and go so to help them hang on and the and and after in the new year it was still sort of neutral but leaning towards La Nina so the feed must have turned up and, and they're in good condition but there was quite a, a range of ages they varied quite a bit and, and that's all to do with um, the uh, uh, kayaker the parent bird 
struggling with eating condition, and they're really good parents and try to read and persevere, and some will be hatched quite late. Ideally, they should all be hatched around New Year. Mm. Well, Michael, uh, we've just about run out of time, but if I could just ask you finally, you've obviously had uh, your first kai of TT for the season. How did you have it? How, how was it cooked? Uh, well, on the island, we were eating it nearly every day, and we would sort of salt them and then cook them, and then sometimes just roast them fresh. Like when they're salted, we boil them up and then crisp the uh, skin in the oven. And um, there's no comparison to having them uh, fresh like that down there on the island to when you get home. Um, once they're salted, the uh, longer they're kept, the uh, stronger it gets. So, uh, they're absolutely delicious. And, and the, one of the key things about it, too, is they're uh, so healthy, uh, full of omega-3, and um, the, uh, the fat's neutral. It won't harm you like sheep and beef or any other animal fat. It's completely safe and uh, uh, plenty of energy from it. I can barely get out the words thank you for joining us because my mouth is watering so much. But thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us, Michael. <laughs> Tēnā koe. Tēnā koe. Well, thank you to our guests and thank you for joining us. Here is Reti Headley and Moitu Smith's experimental waiata fusing both tauna puoro and modern day instruments. Koe nā tapatahi mo tēnei wiki o mo tēnei rā. Kia hau maru te noho. Kia piki te ora haikuna mo tēnei wā.
Peace and love.